Well, good evening, um, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of this municipal year uh, of the Audit and Risk Management Panel. Uh, my name is Councillor David Gardner, and I'm the elected chair of the panel. Um, and it's my um, uh, first meeting as chair. Uh, and now, obviously, it's been separated from uh, the chair of overview and scrutiny. Um, oh. Good evening, Councillor Highland. Um, so it might just be useful if we just go around and introduce ourselves. Um, uh, we, we've all got name plates, but <laughs> so to my right is the committee clerk, uh, Daniel Wilkinson, and uh, then we've got Tom uh, Greensall from Mazars, who will be our auditors under the PSA framework going forward, and we've got Dr. Susan Blackhall, who's the vice chair and uh, as long-standing public service to Greenwich, both on this committee and the Standards Committee. Uh, we have Brendan Costello, who's our Assistant Director for um, Governance and Audit, including in internal audit, which is hence being here tonight. Julian Gokul, the fi uh, Business Manager uh, in the Finance Team, who I know also does pensions. I sit on Pensions Board. And then we've got uh, Hitesh uh, Jalapra, who is the interim assistant director uh, for um, finance, um, substituting tonight or deputising for Damon Cook, who's on holiday or on leave. And then we've got Councillor Lade Olubemi, uh, a member. And also we've just been joined by uh, Councillor Denise Highland, who is the cabinet member for is it finance and resources. Yeah. So thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, if we go through the agenda then, um, we are being uh, recorded and this will be posted on the Council's YouTube channel. So if you are going to speak, uh, please could you switch on your microphone before addressing the meeting and remember to switch it off when you've finished uh, speaking. And you'll be aware that this meeting has been deferred from its original date in June. So originally we were, well, cancelled at quite very short notice. I was even took me by surprise uh, the day before. We were due to meet on the Wednesday 19th of June because of the general election. And uh, then um, last week, a member of this committee uh, asked uh, to delay because um, we were due to meet last Wednesday uh, because of the Euro semi-finals, which I'm sure many of us uh, watched. Um, uh, but that, uh, uh, that member would thought it wouldn't be good to go ahead on the night of the European semi-finals, so um, we've moved it back a week. Um, so thank you for those that have come along, and we will do meet again uh, next Monday, which is the original scheduled meeting, and there's a training session before, uh, um, the, training session before the meeting. Right, moving on with the agenda then, I've had apologies for absence from Councillor Sullivan and Hartley, and most recently from Councillor Nick Williams, who has a cold. Um, are there any other apologies with Damon Cook? No, we haven't heard from Councillor May. Uh, I've not been informed of any urgent business. Um, does any member have any personal or financial interest to declare on any items on the agenda? I see none. Uh, so the minutes, um, we've got a new panel here. So I, mean, I did attend the last meeting though. Uh, as an observer, are, have people had a chance to read the minutes and are they happy to agree the minutes? I've had an email from the previous chair, uh, Councillor Burt McDonald, to say that she was happy with the minutes. Are people happy on that basis to agree the minutes? Thank you. Um, so then moving to the substantive items on the agenda. Firstly, we have the draft uh, work programme. Um, and um, the purpose of this report is to note the terms of reference for the panel, uh, which are in our constitution, and to approve the work programme for the municipal year. Um, so I'm going to propose that we have rolling reports on those cases not implemented, uh, following internal audit. I'm going to propose a deep dive report on, capital, on the capital programme, uh, which is one of the reasons I stood, and Councillor Sullivan is very keen to uh, lead on that. Um, and I would just be interested in, in members' ideas. Obviously, the capital programme 
was something that was pinpointed in the external last Grant Thornton external audit report. Um, and, um, I, you know, we, we do have a role uh, within um, our terms of reference to, to keep, a, keep, keep an eye on the capital program um, and make comments. Uh, obviously, it's for uh, Cabinet to determine. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's been going a long time now. There is an asset management review. Um, so, um, are there any thoughts uh, or questions on the uh, draft work program? from members. Are people happy, members happy, if we do conduct a deep dive on the capital program and ask Councillor Sullivan to lead on that? Yeah. He's got quite a lot of experience in this, uh, in this field, previous leader of Lewisham and so forth. Good. Um, so, are members happy, therefore, if there are no comments, are members happy to approve the work programme with that addition? And we'll fit that in, having talked to Councillor Sullivan and, obviously, to Damon relevant officers. Which moves, then, to item six, um, which is um, rather scared me, the Audit and Risk Management Panel Self-Assessment and Evaluation. Um, and the purpose of this report to note the various updated SIPFA guidance. Um, the SIPFA, do we all know what SIPFA is? Yes? Um, good. Um, got a number of SIPFA members around the table, I'm sure. Uh, consider the SIPFA position statement of guidance and carry out the recommended self-assessment and evaluation. I advise members that training is required as part of being a member of the panel, and the training is, is timetabled for 5 p.m., on Monday. Now, I appreciate that isn't suitable, particularly for working people. Um, so uh, that will be recorded, and therefore people can watch it online at a time which uh, which is convenient to them. Um, okay, um, Brendan, uh, were you going to open on this item, audit, the self-assessment and evaluation? <coughs> Yeah, just got a couple of notes, Chair, just to, to bring to members' attention. Um, you've introduced it for me anyway, actually, to be honest with you, but um, the report's recommended the panel undertakes the evaluation during the next couple of months. During the next couple of months, and, and as you were saying earlier, the, the report was initially supposed to come in June, so we've, we're about a month behind that as such. So the plan is still to try and um, undertake the evaluation, undertake the review with yourself, Chair, and the panel members. Um, but bearing in mind we've, we've slipped back a month, uh, there may be some potential for slippage as to whether or not we can get it back to September's meeting, really, I think. Thank you, uh, Brendan. Are there any comments or questions from members? Um, the oh, Dr. Blackall. Yes, I, I just wondered what's the process for preparing this, who does it? Because it seems quite extensive. Do you, does Brendan, it, do you want to answer you, that? Do you, do, does, does the finance team do this, or who, does, who takes part in it? Strictly speaking, it's, it's the panel that conducts the self-evaluation, um, but obviously I'll be there to support and guide, and so will uh, my colleague Vivian Azici. So we will, um, we can undertake, we've already undertaken a draft review, and we've sort of assessed where we are a, a, as an organisation with the, the, the panel. Um, but really, strictly speaking, it is for the panel to self-assess themselves. So the plan is, obviously, I'll meet with the chair, we'll agree a way forward. The panel will, will work either together or individually to do the self-assessment and compare notes with where we've got, and we'll agree a format with the panel and report back to the September meeting, hopefully. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you very much. I mean, I think my take on this is obviously we're a fairly new ARM panel in, way, in some ways our role has been slightly strengthened and given more independence and, and therefore although you were on the previous panel weren't you Dr Blackhawk uh, I think the rest of us are new so it, it's going to be quite difficult therefore to look at our effectiveness when we're relatively new and before we've had the relevant training and so forth yeah. but, but you say um, we can do this in September 
the original plan was to have it completed by September. You, you and I were, were to meet and agree how we would do that. Um, whilst I can provide some guidance and assistance and some support, it, it really is for the panel to, to conduct that. Um, so, it, again, we were going to meet in June. We were going to meet after the meeting in June and agree a way forward. There's a month slippage. It, it's not that detailed, the assessment, in, in really, I think. Uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it might be simpler than it looks, like, fingers crossed. Um, but if we don't make September, obviously we'll have to do it at, at a later meeting. And that, that was one of the things I should have said with the draft work program as well. I mean, it, it really is a draft because, as you've seen, we've changed dates already. And likewise, the contents of each meeting can move around and there can be new items or we can move something back or whatever. So we'll try for September. If we don't, it'll have to be the next meeting afterwards, I think. I think the important thing is that we actually conduct the review. Well, thank you very much, and I, I think it's actually a very thorough exercise to do, I mean, having looked at it a couple of times now, and, and I also think that SIP have produced some excellent uh, guidance. Um, so if there are no um, further comments or questions on that, are members happy to note, uh, uh, note that report on self-evaluation? Yep, thank you. Um, which brings us then to uh, internal audit and audit for the annual performance report. Um, and this is to note the performance in relation to the delivery of our internal audit plan uh, for the last financial year and to note the head of internal audit opinion on the soundness of the control environment in place as one of the overall assurance assessment provided as part of the annual governance statement. And again, um, Brendan, this is your bag. Thank you, Chair. I'll just um, highlight a few points, really, just in the report, rather than going through it in any detail. Uh, table 1 on page uh, 126, I think, in the bundle, uh, it's, it's details that the target for the draft report completion uh, has not been met. Um, and I know you've been on the panel before, Chair. This is probably the lowest performance we've achieved, I think, uh, since we introduced the figures. Um, and if you look at paragraphs 5.9 and 5 to 5.13, that'll explain the reasons behind that. Um, <clears throat> page 130 for, for Dr. Blackwell there, it's 4.8 out of 5 for the, for, for the questionnaires, which is quite pleasing really. It's, it's, I think that's higher than last year, I think. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, and page 130 also details the annual head of internal and audit report, uh, which again details 89.2% of the areas reviewed by internal audit were demonstrating a satisfactory or a high level of control. Um, we didn't complete as many audits as we wanted to complete by the end of the year. Uh, that figure is based on finalised reports rather than draft reports. So it may have been, a, a, although it's a good level of assurance, it may have been even higher had we been able to get some more of the draft reports to the, to the finalised point. Uh, and the last comment I would make, page 137, uh, details that the London Borough of Bromley has chosen to exercise its option to extend the anti-fraud partnership to the end of this financial year. At uh, some point later in the year, we'll be meeting with Bromley to see how they want to proceed uh, moving forward. But that's, it's been a long-standing arrangement, but we'll have to enter into another, another partnership or another contract um, from April if we're successful. Uh, thank you very much, um, Brendan. Are there uh, the reports before us? We've all had a chance to uh, read it. I mean, I have one or two questions. Are there any questions from uh, members to the internal audit performance report? Um, then I'm just interested just um, to understand the reasons for the, uh, the, the low performance, the low delivery, if you like, of, 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 of the program of, uh, for last year. Um, to what extent, I mean, to what extent was that due to... Um, the capacity of the internal audit uh, team and, um, uh, and, 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 and um, vacancies or, or, or sickness, and to what extent was it due to, um, and this is referred to actually in the report, due to uh, time delays from directorates where you were conducting the, the relevant directorates where you were conducting the, um, the internal audit reviews. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it, it's a mixture, of, a mixture of a lot of things, really. I've tried to put that in the report. Obviously, we've had one member of staff who, unfortunately, is in long-term sickness absence uh, and would have been, uh, that individual would have, for example, would have undertaken 
some of the uh, school reviews, uh, which would have been done quicker, would have been completed, etc. They've had to be given to other members of staff to make sure that they get done within the time frame. So we've lost some resources there. Um, <clears throat> We've also had, uh, and it touches on the next item as well, but we've had an internal audit apprentice. That involves auditors actually mentoring and, and looking after that apprentice. Uh, we've got another apprentice who's due to start later on in the year. We're just going through a recruitment process for that at the moment. Um, and again, it's, it's a double-edged sword, really. I, I would say, as a panel, you would want us to find, um, want us to make sure that we're diligent and we find areas that are, that are problematic and we, and we help management put those right. The, the, the contra side of that is that those audits become more complex and take more time and more resource. It means that some of the other audits would have to slide to, able, to be able to accommodate those. Um, the other thing I should say, and I was going to touch upon it in the next report, we do have a shortage of staff. Um, one, of the, one of the good sides of that is that we report an underspend in the budget and we contribute towards the underspend. Uh, the, the bad side of that, obviously, is that sometimes we struggle to, to, to get our audits completed. Um, without going on too much with the next, uh, next item, uh, we have gone through a recruitment process, um, and we will have more auditors later on in the year. So the plan itself will be extended, and I don't think we'll have the same problem for this financial year. Thank you. I want to sort of congratulate you on exceeding the productivity target for the second year at 83% compared to the target of 80% of of actually time on the job as compared to uh, you know other non-direct um, time, um, that that that's really good. Um, I wondered how that compared to if you like industry performance across to internal audit teams and external or internal audit providers. Is 80% a, a normal benchmark, or is that just something that we've decided is appropriate? <laughs> When we set the target initially, we did some benchmarking, <clears throat> but I'd have to be honest and say we don't do a great deal of benchmarking anymore. It's one of those things that's, you know, it's gone to the side, really, I'm afraid. Uh, so I couldn't give you a, a definite answer as to whether that's a good level of performance in comparators to, to other organisations. But certainly when we set the target of 80% of, of initially, um, we wanted to set something that was achievable, but likewise, someone, something that did push us to make sure it wasn't just a target we would make every year. And, and as you can see from 21, 22, we, we, we didn't make the target that year. And part of that obviously was, was part of the pandemic and COVID, but normally we make the target. But 83% for a target of 80% isn't too bad. But. Thank you. Um, I've got one more question, but I don't want to, on the substance of the report, but I don't want to uh, dominate. Do other members have any questions on this report? Dr. Blackall. I suppose it, it, it's, it's just a general question, really. Um, you know, from, from my experience of, of the panel and, and the reports and things, there seems to be a very good planning process in place to decide what the internal audit should be doing, and recommendations have been made to specific directors as to what they should be doing, and you follow those up. But there seems to be a kind of growing underlying failure in some areas for the director to actually deliver on what was agreed and to report back on time to give you the information that you need. And, and this appears to be increasing the risk of us, of the council failing to deliver on its strategic plans, financial plans. And I just wonder what, what whether it's the responsibility of this panel or not, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure and would be happy to be advised on that, but is there anything we can do to help improve that or what should be done to, is the result of this failure to follow up because people are incapable of doing it, the targets have been set too high, there's no resources or not enough resources or on their part or I don't really know, but it, it just, it's very worrying. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> yes, I'd agree with, with, with some of what you said. I mean, you, you may recall we had some we had officers back. It wasn't the last meeting. I think it was the meeting prior to that. Um, and obviously they were saying about they're struggling with the staff in those as other implications and that there's a backlog and they're catching up. Um, it is a problem for internal audit to get the... Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say it's not a problem. It, it is genuinely a problem for us sometimes to get information back from some of the directorates and some of the teams. And that causes us problems. Um, but... There is a role for the audit and risk management panel to play, but it's 
we're following very much an excavation plan. So, and I think I've, it may be in the next item actually. What I've done is I've, I've gone to the Greenwich management team and I've said, look, this is a problem and it's a, we've experienced a problem. I need you to take ownership of that and to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we've changed the processes somewhat. So the Greenwich management team will become involved, particularly where it's a limited assurance. The, the team, the Greenwich management are going to receive that, that limited assurance report and they'll see the actual plan and they'll see the recommendations. And whether that's a naming and shaming scenario or not, I don't know, but the idea of it being is it's gone to GMT, then there should be a greater, uh, greater emphasis on getting that information and that stuff back to, back to the auditors. Can I just, com just comment on that? I mean, I, I saw elsewhere that the setting up of the GMT mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing, which seemed very good. <coughs> Will we get any feedback on how progress is being made to reduce those issues? Sorry, I didn't turn my mic off. The short, short answer is yes. Uh, many years ago, we had a similar problem. It's, it's not a new thing. It's a, re it's a recurring thing. Uh, and when it was uh, Councillor Stanley, I think, that was the, was the chair, um, I had to go to him and say, look, you need to speak to the chief executive and you need to speak to the directors because it's not happening. So that's the escalation policy. So we, we try with GMT and if it doesn't work, then it comes back to the arm panel. The arm panel would speak to, speak to you know, directors. I think just generally in the, in the current financial situation, um, with the, the risks that are involved across the board, really, many things that are not necessarily in the Council's control. It's really important we do our bit to minimise this and make get the cost down. Yes, no, I quite agree. And, and I, would, I, mean, I would say that anyway, but GMT were quite responsive at the meeting, certainly, to make sure that we were going to take it forward. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. Um, Lade. I'm struggling to hear. Is it possible to just move a little bit closer to the microphone, please? And if you could just kindly project your voices, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's a very important uh, point that Susan was making. Do, do, I mean, this wasn't my question, but do you think that there is value in us making a recommendation that uh, directorates do need to prioritize uh, internal audit reviews in a timely fashion? They get advance notice of the plan. They know when they're going to be reviewed. Um, do, do they need to give it more priority? Rather, right, that you know, children's services would for an Ofsted inspection, or adult social care certainly would for a CQC inspection. Uh, should an internal audit review have a similar level of priority? I think, to be honest, Chair, I've raised it with with, with GMT. I think we should probably. Um give that some time to see if that, if that does the trick. And if it doesn't, rest assured I'll be back to see you and, and ask it to be raised, raised again. So are members happy to leave that there for the moment and come back if it persists as a, an issue? Um, so my um, question was actually around anti-fraud performance. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in this. And um, I, I'd just like to understand a bit more I mean, we've obviously got a number of areas highlighted in terms of your investigations on anti-fraud, uh, which is excellent. But what do you think is the, um, the most sizable area uh, where there is potent, where there's fraud uh, within the council? And how do we, and, and is there a particular growing, an area of growth um, of, in, in, in fraud? And that may be an observation, not just in, in this authority, but other authorities. And I've got a particular interest in blue badge fraud, having witnessed someone last night in my ward actually getting out of their car and passing a blue badge to someone else, challenging them, say, challenging them and they said, what the hell's it got to do with you? <laughs> Stupidly, I didn't take a photo of the registration number or anything like that. Um, but um, I just wondered if you could give a, a bit of flavor of how you conduct the blue badge uh, anti-fraud uh, reviews and what um, mechanisms are in place on that. So you're specifically talking about blue badge? Firstly, in general, I wonder what the, the largest area in, in value in terms was for fraud and whether there are any particular growth areas. And then I was asking specifically about blue badge, which may not be by far the, the biggest area. <coughs> The key area, or the, the, if we were still investigating housing benefit fraud, I would say housing benefit fraud would be the most prevalent area. Uh, we've had a, a, an historic problem, as you would know, you've been on the, the panel before, the, the Department for Work and Pensions now investigates um, benefit fraud. 
and I, I don't think I'd be out of step with my other colleagues in other local authorities and say I don't really think it's given the same priority as it was when it was a local authority responsibility. So I think benefit fraud is still, still a key issue. It doesn't seem to be on anyone's agenda at the moment. Uh, after that, I think um, it depends what you mean uh, when you mean you know, the most important or the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest loss to the council would be housing tenancy fraud. Um, so we still look at housing tenancy fraud. There's a team in housing, the unauthorised occupation team, who still do some good work there, etc. Um, it's one of those areas where um, it's a bit like painting the, painting the fourth bridge. Is that still a thing now? I don't know. But um, we've got 22,000 council tenancies. Most reports will tell you that 5% of those are, are, are fraudulent. I've got to say I don't agree. I'd say it's less than that. I'd say it's probably 2 or 3%. Any time that we've done some proactive work or we've done some other exercises, we normally hit about 2 to 3% of those that were fraudulent. Back in the day, we used to have a team that used to, used to go out and physically knock on doors. They only found 2 or 3% of that. Um, direct payment fraud is um, problematic. Uh, it's very difficult to, to um, very difficult to get to the bottom. To in some areas, the only way you can do that is actually physically observe a person who's not as uh, who isn't as disabled or has not got as, diff as many difficulties as they say they have. So they could be quite labour intensive, quite resource intensive. Um, most of those people will have a genuine illness or a difficulty or, or, or some sort of disability, but they're just exaggerating that or they're making payments to someone they shouldn't be making payments to. So they're always uh, quite difficult to do. Um, the blue badge cases, it's, it's interesting really you ask that question because obviously we do work for Bromley as well and we sort of operate two different approaches. Um, Bromley it's far more, they put far more, um, try to find how I can say this politely, uh, it's a big thing for Bromley, blue, blue badge fraud. It's constantly pressurised for us to, to, to make sure there's a prosecution. Um, you know, yes, there's some cautions, yes, there's some warning letters that go out, but predominantly the push is to prosecute as many people as possible. Uh, that costs quite a bit of money. Uh, you don't get the money back from that. You know, a fine goes to the court. You might get some costs, but it won't be the cost that it's cost you to take someone to it for a prosecution. But Bromley are very keen to, to, to get that message out there. Um, same here at, at, at Greenwich, but we don't, we don't have as, as many cases as Bromley would have. Um, the blue badge misuse, again, it can be quite difficult. You've seen that individual, but you don't know who that individual was. You don't know which one of those individuals was the badge holder, if they were the badge holder. So in, the, in, in previous times, we would have someone that would park their car. You'd need to have something to confirm that they were there on their own and the badge holder wasn't with them. If there's no CCTV or the CEO hasn't witnessed the car you know, parking up, it's difficult to do something in, in those instances. So the focus now tends to be on badges that have already been reported stolen or lost or, or their counterfeit badges. Um, so that's what we tend to focus on. So the CEOs, or, sorry, the, the civil enforcement officers or someone from parking would tell us there's a, there's a PCN penalty charge note has been issued, but by the way, we've checked and this blue badge belongs to someone that's reported as stolen or whatever and then we'll try and pick the pieces up from there. But they are very, so I've got officers who are investigating really complex internal fraud maybe, like, like the lift engineer job, uh, or investigating a housing fraud or a right to buy fraud. And I'd say they're exercised as much by the blue badge frauds as they are with those, because it's very difficult to ascertain what the next course of action is. And it's very difficult to see whether or not it's in the public interest to prosecute. Um, so. We've got quite a lot of them, um, and I'd like to say they're quite simple and they're quite easy, but they're not really, and it, they, they do take up quite a bit of resource. I'm not sure that's answered your question, Chair, I'm afraid. Sorry. But... Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe on, on the agenda for another day. Um, so do members have any other questions or comments they want to make as a result of this uh, report? I see none. So thank you very much, Brendan. Obviously, if you keep us in touch on performance, and as you know, um, I'm interested also to see um, some sort of table of the recommendations from reviews and to what extent they've been implemented or, why they've, or when they haven't been implemented, there may be a good reason why they've not been implemented uh, from the reviews, because that's the key, really. There's no point having a review uh, if the recommendations from it are, are you know, widely ignored. I assume that's not the case uh, from the report. So are members happy to note that report? Uh, noted, thank you. Um, which brings us to the internal audit plan uh, for the coming year. 
Um, and again, that's over to Brendan. Okay, I'll just go through some brief highlights again. That's the standard annual report will be advised of the plan. Um, we like to have some flexibility in the plan for contingencies, um, but there has, I think, um, Grant Thornton did make a comment before they left about we need to increase the internal audit resources. The, the plan as it stands in that, uh, in that item was constructed based on the, the resource level that we had at the time of writing the report. Uh, and I think I've highlighted that we could use a framework arrangement to fill any potential shortfalls in, in, in coverage. Page 159 um, referred members to a recruitment exercise that was ongoing uh, at the time of writing the report. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've been successful at recruitment and we'll have three new experienced uh, internal auditors starting with us in the next few weeks. I haven't got an ETA on exact start dates, but it should be in the next few weeks. Uh, and that should mean three things for the plan. Firstly, the level of productive time should increase. Uh, we should be able to have a bigger coverage of the plan. We shouldn't really be able to be looking to use the framework agreement. Um, and again, we should be able to extend the coverage and, and add some other reviews that are not currently detailed in the plan. So I've given you the internal audit plan, but again, pretty much that's almost in draft format because it is going to change when the new members of staff start, I'm afraid. Uh, and again, as with the... Uh, uh, in, as with the anti-fraud work, uh, members have received quarterly updates on the progress against the plan, and I'll have to give you another item at another meeting, council, where we, we've changed the plan to show you what's included, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions or comments in relation to the plan for 24-25? I see none, so thank you very much. Um, I was just going to ask um, that over 35% of our spend, it may be slightly more than that, is in health and adult services, but they're only 6% of the days uh, in the 24-25 plan. Is that because it, the, the, most of the areas there have been reviewed uh, recently? Um, and, and, you know, the, or, or is it just reflect the scope and the nature of the, um, the spend? I think, well, I can't answer that specifically, but I think you'll find um, that there are some areas where we are obliged or mandated to conduct a, a review, particularly the, the material systems. So whilst I may have 770 days, there's a large block of that days that's already accounted for. So you then have to risk assess as to what areas you can include to make sure you're, you're getting those areas with the highest risk. So you may well find when I come back later in the year that it, it won't be you know, 50 days or 66 days or 6.5%, it'll be uh, a significant amount more because we've been able to add some additional work in there that we can't include at the moment. Are there any further points on this report? No, uh, in which case are members happy to note the plan? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, then we come to the um, external audit plan. Uh, so welcome uh, Tom uh, from Mazars and uh, Tom Greensill, uh, our new external auditors under the PSA um, framework. And um, this is a very important uh, item. Um, so over to you, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll take the report as read, um, but if we could turn First to, I think in your packs it's page uh, 180. Um, as we've just mentioned, the audit team has changed slightly, so I'll be taking Stuart Frith's place as the engagement man manager. Um, the rest of the team is remaining the same. Um, if we move on to page 184, um, this outlines the audit scope approach and the timeline. Um, and so we have a slight change for you to note in that the field work is now starting in September and will run to January as, as already planned. Um, and that's as a result of another client being um, unready for audit and we've had to make some um, movements with teams around. Um, but it shouldn't pose any uh, difficulties to delivery as expected um, in January. Um, the next page is 187 where we outline our significant risks um, and our key judgments. The first of those is the management override of controls, which is um, a mandatory significant risk on all um, external audits. And that's because of the unpredictable way in which 
um, such an override could occur. So management at various levels within an entity um, are in the unique position to um, perpetrate fraud, and that's because they can manipulate the accounting records and prepare fraudulent financial statements by overriding controls that otherwise would appear to be operating effectively. Um, that isn't to say that we think there's a particular risk of it um, at Greenwich, um, but we identify it as one across all of our audits. Um, so the way that we'll address that risk um, is through performing audit work over the accounting estimates, journal entries, and significant transactions outside of the normal course of business, or that we otherwise would consider to be unusual. Um, and we'll carry out um, also um, completeness checks to make sure that all of the data has been included and verify the information that's provided by the entity. Um, the second significant risk that's been identified is uh, the valuation of property, plant, and equipment. Um, as the council has three billion of property, uh, plant, and equipment, the code requires um, that the carrying value um, should reflect the appropriate fair value at year end. Um, because of the way that PPE is valued, there are a number of um, assumptions um, with inherent subjectivity, um, and there are a number, and a lot of these are complex as well. Um, and that means that there's a risk of material misstatement on this balance. Um, council dwellings are the most valuable um, asset, which are 2.9 billion of the 3 billion of PPE. Um, and these are valued using a beacon valuation process, which is slightly different to um, how a normal valuation uh, would occur. So the way that we'll address this risk is we'll look at the approach taken by the valuer um, and we'll um, assess the risk of those assets which haven't um, been uh, revalued at year end as well. Um, we'll challenge the valuation methodology and we'll look at the bases which have been used um, for the different types of assets to make sure that they are appropriate. Um, and then we will um, also assess the values qualifications, ensure that they're objective and independent, um, and we'll perform some sample testing around the underlying data and assumptions. Um, we may also engage the Mazars valuation team where we think there are any risks, and that will be depending on the um, fixed asset register and those properties which have been revalued when we assess that. Um, the final uh, significant risk that we've identified is the net defined benefit liability uh, valuation. Um, and this is because of the use of uh, discount rates, um, inflation rates, mortality rates, um, all of which, um, again, come with a degree of estimation uncertainty. Um, and so we'll address this risk by reviewing the controls that the council has in place over the information which, excuse me, <coughs> is sent to the scheme actuary. Um, we'll also assess the competence and skill of the, act, of the funds actuary and challenge the reasonableness of the assumptions which they've used. Um, we'll carry out a range of substantive procedures on the relevant information and on the cash flows used by actuary as part of that um, annual uh, IS-19 valuation as well. Um, moving on from significant risks to page 194, um, where we're looking at value for money arrangements. Um, in the prior year, um, Grant Thornton identified two um, significant weaknesses in arrangements. The first of these was over the over-reliance on reserves and other short-term measures to deliver services. Um, and so we'll be engaging management to assess what progress has been made in relation to the recommendations um, and to understand what short-term measures have been implemented since the prior year. Um, and we will also conduct a review to um, ascertain whether the council has input appropriate plans for savings and ultimately address um, the risk of financial sustainability. Uh, this will include a review of the medium-term financial strategy, um, plans to monitor savings, um, to replenish reserves and the evidence of that implementation, and also um, how the setting and monitoring of savings um, is going. Um, the second risk is around the risk of fire um, and take precaution. So we will be engaging with management to understand what pro progress has been made in um, settling the requirements of the regulatory notice, and then we'll be um, seeking corroborative evidence to support that work as well. Um, and then moving on to audit fees. Um, so this is on page 197 of your pack. Um, what you'll notice um, is the scale fee, which has increased. This is as a result of the um, tender, which uh, was undertaken by uh, public PSAA. Um, and so 
this reflects the constraints in the audit market at the moment in terms of uh, resource in the public sector and also um, it's to reset um, a lot of the additional work which has been um, uh, which auditors have been obliged to do since the last scale fee um, was set. Overall, um, there's been an increase of 151% in the fees across the system. You'll notice that isn't um, the same percentage in the fee um, above. Um, Fulbis Mazars don't have any um, input into how much the scale fee is as well. If we move now on to materiality, which um, is on page 200, um, I don't know how much um, the um, members of this committee will have seen on materiality before, so I might give um, a bit of an explanation. Um, so the overall materiality that we set is um, determined um, with reference to a benchmark. That benchmark is um, what's most useful to the readers of the financial statements. So in the case of the council, it's gross revenue expenditure. Um, and we've set that at 1.8%, which um, we predict will give an overall materiality of 19.5. I must say that um, this report was put together before we received the draft financial statement, so that will be revised. Um, the performance materiality um, has been set at 60%. Um, and so we set this performance materiality, um, which is slightly lower, and that's to ensure that any errors which are picked up on don't exceed um, materiality overall. And if it does breach this level, we will ask for um, the adjustments to be corrected in the financial statements. Um, and then the clearly trivial level is the um, level above which we'll report to this committee. Um, we do have a slightly uh, lower percentage than Grant Thornton, who I think we're at 5%. We set this at 3%, um, however, it won't be that different to what you're used to seeing. Um, have we got any questions on this report before I move on to the pension fund? Right. Um, so before we move to the pension fund, I just at this stage wanted to ask um, Hitesh or Councillor Highland whether you've got anything that you wanted to add at this point before we invite members in. No, Chair, other than to thank very much. Thank you for everything you've done. Uh, and obviously to thank the officers for all the reports tonight. Um, and their conscientious work that they always do. And just to say how much confidence we have in um, the finance team, especially dear old Brendan here, who uh, I'm very proud of your work, Brendan. Thank you. Thank you. Hitesh, did you have something on the uh, external audit? So yes, plan. thank you, Councillor. Um, Tom and I have um, um, just met recently as, 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 because he's newly appointed. On, on the three key risks that Tom has um, um, explained this evening, Greenwich has not had problems historically on that. In terms of some of the process, in terms of where we are, um, obviously, um, Mazars have got away accounts. Um, Mazars have also gave us a list of all the prepared by client requirements. And most of those, if not all of them, are with Mazars, but Tom will confirm that in the next day or two. So we are preparing ourselves for, for the um, field work in September to go as smoothly as possible. Thanks. So, I mean, I, th I think, um, and I'm sure members are aware of this, that there has been significant issues with the public sector audit market, particularly in local governments, ever since the pandemic, really. And as a result of that, the PSAA conducted a consultation, and we haven't had results of that yet because of the general election. At least I don't think we've had the result. Uh, but I know from other audit committees I've on that um, many organisations struggled a, a, a few years behind. Uh, Greenwich, though, has always actually been ahead of the curve. Historically, we'd have our audit done in July. Um, the uh, reporting date, the statutory reporting deadline is, is it the end of September or November now? September. Yeah, September. September. But you're only starting in September. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to ask, I mean, Grant Thornton always did a very good job um, when they were our PSAA auditors. Obviously, they've been rotated off now. And, and generally, they, there was a, they, they have a good reputation. EY, I know, which I chair another audit committee, and 
uh, there at the other end. They, they've got a very bad reputation. I, in, in terms of their, the timeliness of their performance, I wonder where Mazars are in terms of your performance against the, um, uh, uh, against the statutory uh, reporting timescales. Um, unfortunately, since you questioned just before the meeting, I haven't got internet access, um, so I haven't been able to look that up, but I can come back to the committee with um, the performance if you want. Councillor Highland, did you want to comment uh, on this? Chair, I think, um, am I right that it's been a, there's been a lot of delay because of the valuation of property, yeah. um, which has caused a lot of local authorities to be late in, in the production of this? Yeah, that, oh, am I still on? Yeah, that's correct. So I think, in general, the expectations of auditors to look into property valuations has increased over the last few years, um, where resource hasn't increased, and that's been compounded by the delays from um, COVID. Um, there are other areas as well where we're having to pay um, more attention to the accounts, and so that met, has made the previous reporting deadlines um, untenable. Thank you. Um, well, it would be useful to have a, a dialogue uh, directly with the audit committee, um, and I think we'll be obviously very interested in your eventual report, um, but we're particularly obviously, I think, keen to see conclusion on the timescale that you've laid out, which is by January, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we'd prefer it earlier to meet the deadline, but if, given it can't be, then by the deadline that's set out, so it'd be good if there's no, no slippage. And it would also be good to meet the audit partner. I know he's ill at the moment, but at some point. Yeah, he'll be along to committee as soon as he can do. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments on the external audit plan from members? Um, are people happy to uh, note that report then? Yes, noted. Thank you. Uh, then that brings us to the last uh, substantive item on the agenda. All oh, right, the last item on the agenda, which is the Community Municipal Investment and Green Finance Framework. Um, so uh, this is to note the launch of the Council's um, Community Municipal Investment to fund green projects, uh, to note the Graft Green Finance Framework, and to note the Council will be signing up to the Green Finance Institute Local Climate Bond Pledge. So when this uh, report was first agreed, um, it was agreed the audit committee would have a look, audit risk management panel would have a look and uh, offer our comments. So um, I think, Julian, are you going to introduce this? Thank you very much, Chair. I'll briefly go over the three recommendations in the decision section of the report. Um, the first, as you said, is the launch of the Community Municipal Investment, CMI. This was previously known as a green bond. The Council is set to launch this in early September through a crowdfunding platform, working with a third-party provider who has done this with over 11 councils now. The council is planning to raise the initial 1 million, given residents and local business the opportunity to invest as little as five pounds towards this target. As you said, Chair, all borrowing will be ring-fenced for a green initiative. Um, the second one is the green finance framework. So the framework provides a foundation upon which to issue an accredited green municipal investment. It provides an overarching criteria and guidelines as to how the council will issue and manage the CMI. Please note this is an early draft and we'll go through further changes to the framework before and after the launch date. And finally, the council plans to sign up to the Green Finance Institution Pledge. This pledge is designed to support council with early stage engagement it's non-legally binding, but instead demonstrates a commitment to taking climate action locally. One sign we will be 11 Council to have made this pledge. Lastly, I'd just like to say, while finance is presented in this report, it's largely a collaborative effort across the Council in order to make this a success. Happy to take any questions or comments, or if, unless any of my colleagues want to add anything else. Uh, any Colleagues or Councillor Highland want to add anything to the report? No? 
Do uh, members have any questions or comments particularly interested in, in, in this report? Dr. Blackwell. Yes, just on page 251, um, where you have the table showing how much was raised for um, three, different, three different councils. And Hackney, I know this is currently live, so they haven't, obviously haven't reached their target. But do you know how much more time, they, what, you know, have they just started or where are they along the process? Are they likely to hit that target or are they way off? Or do you know? Thanks, good question. I don't know what the latest position at Hackney. Last time we had a look at it, I think they were close to the target. Um, normally it opens for three months, it's a three months window, so they had a bit of time to. But I can look up and send you an email. You know, yeah. Could I just ask, I, maybe I've missed this in the report, but what uh, have we determined what uh, rate we're going to, what interest rate uh, people investing in the bond will, uh, will, will receive? Chair, can I, can I try and answer the question? I, th I think um, in coming up with the rate we'll agree, we're going to look at the PWLB rates, we're going to look at the guilt rates, the market conditions at the time, and, just, uh, and that's how, we'll, how we're going to come up with a sensible rate. And we'll make sure in terms of delegations, this is, this is subject to agreement by cabinet, this is delegated to the finance director, he'll get a full briefing on the rate to be agreed. On that briefing, he'll make a decision. And I think it would be, because generally you get up to 5%, maybe a bit more than 5% with one or two banks at the moment in bonds. So I, I think it's on the one hand got to be competitive, but obviously not too costly. And it would be useful to see I mean, there are three uh, other local authority green bonds mentioned there but, uh, with differing interest rates. But interesting to see whether Hammersmith and Fulham, for example, um, well, they, they certainly Hackney have been less successful, but that's perhaps because it's currently live. It's, it's behind the curve. So it would be useful to sort of monitor and see how other bonds have, um, have, have, have and how, how important the interest rate is in terms of leveraging, some people will give. Some people will buy bonds just because they feel it's the right thing to do because they're interested in green bonds. Other people will be obviously more mindful of whether the rate, how competitive the interest rate is. And if they can get a better rate elsewhere, they'll go elsewhere. Yes, thanks, Chair. And as um, Hitesh has said, we'll definitely be monitoring that aspect of it. So we'll look at what retail bonds rates are like but we also will be looking at um, guilt rate. And as you know, interest rate is forecast to move down, so we'll be keeping a close eye on that and how we peg that. But that will be down to the Director of Finance to have a look at that. Yeah. But I'm certainly happy to report back to the committee. Yeah. Councillor Highland. Yes, yeah, sorry, Chair. You did invite me earlier, and uh, I missed this point. Uh, when I first saw this report, I was a bit worried given that we're a kind of blue chip company and we want our residents to invest in us and we don't want reputational damage about this um, warning, if you like, that your investment can go down as well as up. Um, but I understand that that's an FCA um, condition and that obviously there is actually a fixed rate. There will be a fixed rate of return for people and that in effect people's capital would not be at risk unless of course abundance went to the wall in which case I'm sure we'd be uh, you know assuring it um, so I, I personally uh, probably should declare an interest because I'd very much like to invest I think this is a really good scheme that I think we could get some really good publicity out there and allow the residents to feel that they're actively engaged in uh, tackling climate change. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And do you think um, that we have the expertise to be able to identify those projects that will bring the necessary uh, returns. Yeah, th th thank you, Chair. So j just to put this in context, the capital projects in terms that's geared towards this green initiative, it's already in the pipeline. They're 
the team is looking at this, what are we doing? We, instead of doing PWL will be boring, replacing them with green ones boring. So when we know those projects, we have to come back and identify those specific projects that we will be funding. But this will be reported through the investor, back to the investors, so they have an update. Um, any further questions or comments from members on this report? Susan. Yeah, just on the, on the issue of the interest rates, if, you know, people, a lot of people may be investing quite small amounts. And so the difference on return across those interest rates that the other councils are using ultimately would be very small, unless you're putting in, you know, a full ISSA's worth or something like that. Um, so it, it isn't too material. I, I, I would doubt that that variation in interest rates would make a difference to how, how many people invested. Well, thank you. Um, any further comments? I mean, I'm very uh, keen on this and, and keen to be involved. And like Councillor Highland, I'm also keen perhaps to, um, uh, to buy a bond if Council's allowed to do so. <laughs> um, so, um, but um, our members, do members have any other comments on the, um, on the report? So we're happy to note that report then and to generally approve the concept and principle of, uh, of a green bond. Thank you. Now, I'm conscious, I thought we'd come to the end, but I'm conscious that I um, cut off uh, Maz Tom before you got to the pension fund audit, um, for which I apologize profusely. <laughs> and thank you for your forbearance and not uh, bringing it up. Uh, but I, I, if you could just say a few words then about the audit of the pension fund um, that's relevant for this, uh, for this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll keep it relatively short and sweet because some of the detail is the same. Um, so the timeline will be concurrent with the main audit. Um, on page 227, um, we've got the significant risks, and there are two which we've identified. The first is management override of controls, which is the same as for the main council. Um, and the second is the valuation of investments, which are at level three within the um, fair value hierarchy. That means um, where there's an input which has an impact on the fair valuation, uh, which is unobservable, um, and so therefore is inherently more subjective um, and can be manipulated. So we'll address that risk by um, agree, agreeing holdings from fund managers to global custodian reports, agreeing the valuation to supporting documentation, including investment manager uh, valuation statements and cash flows for any adjustments uh, made to the investment manager valuation, Agreeing the investment manager valuation to the audited accounts or other independent supporting documentation where available. Um, and where they are available, we'll also make sure that they're supported by a clean audit opinion. Um, that pretty much covers it apart from materiality. So unlike on the council side, materiality is set on net assets for a pension fund as those are of main interest to the readers of the financial statements. Um, and we've set those at 1% rather than 1.8%. Um, the performance materiality is set at 70%, which gives headline of 15.843 and performance materiality of 11.09. Again, those will be revised um, and a clearly trivial threshold of 475K. Um, I'll leave it at that if that's okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, sorry again. I just wondered if. Uh, Julian, as the officer dealing with the pension fund, whether you had anything to add? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, nothing to add, just um, echo what Matesha said. We've submitted um, the draft set of accounts and we're working with auditors in terms of the working paper. So this will come before the pension committee as well, so you have another chance. Thank you. Um, do members have any questions or comments in terms of the external audit of the pension fund? Are you happy to note that report as well? Thank you very much. So I believe that now brings us to the end of this meeting. Um, so um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, uh, particularly our external auditor, um, and, um, and look forward to seeing many of you, or all the members and many of you others again uh, next Monday on the 22nd, where we have training at 5 p.m., uh, which will be recorded if people can't make it, so they can watch it, and then we have the uh, meeting uh, in public at 6.30 p.m. 
uh, and the agenda has already been circulated and includes the full um, external audit, audit report from Grant Thornton, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's going to be an important meeting. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you on Monday. <laughs>